Well, I think we'd better get started because uh, we do want to leave some time uh, for questions because that really is, uh, in some ways, the heart of the conference is to give you all a chance to respond to what you hear. So um, uh, Peter is now here. We're very glad you're here, Peter. Um, uh, Peter Bach is a professor at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, he's also uh, been very involved and been a special assistant to uh, CMS in terms of advising on payment policies. And uh, he's uh, graciously uh, agreed to come down uh, for the day to talk to us about reimbursement reform in oncology. Peter? Thanks, Scott, and apologies for uh, not being here earlier. I did watch the meeting yesterday on the web, uh, which actually was great. It makes me wonder if I'll ever get on a plane again. Um, the <laughs> I've done something terrible already. Oh, all right. Michael, can you get me back to the beginning? I think it's right and left. Right and left? Okay. Great. This is part of the problem. It's been mentioned before. Deb mentioned it yesterday. Shown on this graph is by year of FDA approval, the introductory price in the Medicare program for cancer drugs approved by the FDA starting in 65. The x axis, for those of you who've forgotten this, is along here. This is updated as of a few months ago. The y-axis is prices in 2012 dollars. And uh, we've had to rescale this y-axis about every year we've been at this, which is about six years. Uh, the, the cost of cancer care is rising, in part driven by the unit prices of cancer drugs. That has nothing to do with what sort of doctors take home necessarily as reimbursement has changed. If you narrow down into sort of a global view of Medicare Part B, which are physician-administered drugs, and a couple other drugs that kind of slipped in there, like capcitabine, an oral drug, which is a pro-drug, uh, the, there's been a steady rise in spending on Part B drugs. Most but not all of this is oncology care. And the rate of rise is actually only about 4% compounded. But it's still real. This small step down is either a big success for the MMA, the 2003 legislation that changed from AWP to ASP, or a terrible failure, depending on how you look at it. This step down was not as big as most people expected, in part because manufacturers responded to it by raising unit prices. So what I'm going to talk about is different approaches to payment reform. If you will, this is a 30,000 or maybe a 10,000 foot flyover. I'm going to talk about the big buckets, if you will, possible approaches to reimbursement reform. I'm going to touch on a couple of things in more depth, gloss over other ones where I feel less confident that I have something to say. But I just want to sort of give you an idea. So I'm going to talk about episode-based payments and global fees and the whole notion of shifting risk, the new payment types that have been mentioned several times yesterday as well as this morning, patient-centered medical home, value-based modifiers, quality incentives, and uh, disintermediation. I'm going to talk about the elimination of certain services that uh, a couple people talked about yesterday, including the Choosing Wisely campaign. And that's the easy stuff. Then I'll get to the hard stuff. So this is a paper we had last year where we introduced this idea of episode-based payment in cancer care. I want to distinguish it. We do it in the article as well from what Lee was talking about earlier today, the approach they take in United Healthcare, which I will talk about in a second. But the whole notion of episode-based payment revolves around shifting risk at a certain level. And let me explain what it is. Today's oncologist operates in most environments fee for service. The idea of a global fee or an episode based payment bundling, these are different terms that have been interchanged, is to shift the risk so that the pro provider gets a single payment to take care of, the, of a patient for an episode of care. Of course, everything revolves around what's in the payment, what's it supposed to cover, what defines an episode. But this is the basic idea. And what it does from an insurance perspective is it puts the provider or the oncologist at risk for performance. The way they use those dollars effectively leads them to losses or profits. Appropriate utilization during the episode is something to be efficient. They can put, if you will, some savings in their pockets. This is di different from fee-for-service, the environment under which most of us operate. Fee-for-service has no insurance risk. There is a risk that Aetna won't pay the bill you send to them, but that's not a risk in any real way in, in an insurance context. If you do it, you can bill for it in fee-for-service. Um, it's different from capitation, which is per head, which includes this insurance risk. You could take capitated risk for everyone in this room, whoever gets cancer, hopefully no one, or everybody who gets cancer, any proportion, you're at risk. And so you have this insurance risk that some people may develop the event or not. Um, and episode-based payment only works when there are competitive approaches. And this was the operational example. Shown on this slide, we advance the argument that 
you could pay oncologists for the cost of chemotherapy for, for example, a month of treatment of metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. They could take that payment, and all they had to do was to agree to follow guidelines. And what we illustrate in this paper, as well as for a number of other regimens, was that if you open up the guidelines, and it doesn't matter which guideline you choose, you're going to see this, that all of these different regimens are listed side by side, and the oncologists in the room will know that cis is either cis or carbo. It depends on the regimen. From a cost perspective, it doesn't matter for this, and so it doesn't matter for the purpose of this example. But anyway, you, all you have to do is open up, and you get a Chinese menu, if you will, a, a set of choices that all these organizations are saying, these are all perfectly appropriate. Once you have that, you have an opportunity for competition, just like you do when you walk into Best Buy and you see four TVs by four different manufacturers, all the same size. And competition, this will never happen in Best Buy. The price differences between similarly sized TVs will be a few bucks based on, I don't know, fancy or remote control or whether or not it has, I don't know, stereo or a Netflix connection. But in this, if you look at the Medicare reimbursements, and this includes both the drug and also the admin fees and supportive care fees because they vary by drug, you'll see wildly different price differences. You'll never see this in Best Buy, but the cost of PEM with a platinum agent is seven grand, tax all carbos, 1,200 per month, standardized Medicare patient, including admin fees, including supportive care drugs. Now, we generated this slide. You don't have to believe it. The New York Times said it was true. <laughs> Under an episode-based payment format, you would go to an oncologist or an oncology practice, and you'd say, here is your lump sum payment. From this, you will pay for the cost of the drug, the infusion, and the supportive care for a month of therapy for metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. This is an arbitrary dollar amount. 3,500 bucks is where we drew the line. Basically, I say, here's your money. Now, you go out in the marketplace and you buy these services. Nurse time, chair time, supportive care, drug time, tax all, carbo, PEM, whatever. And this is the incentive they face. Here are the regimens listed just like they were on the other slide. Here are the dollar amounts from Medicare reimbursement perspective for the different regimens for a month. And it's broken into the admin fees and supportive care versus the drug costs. And you can see there's a big difference for, let's say, taxol carbo. It's heavily loaded in one way. PEM carbo is heavily loaded the other. And this is the incentive. If you're an oncologist getting $3,500, if you want to give somebody PEM with a platinum, you're going to pay about $3,500 out of pocket. That's a loss. If you want to give them taxol carbo, you get $3,500, it costs you about $1,200. The difference between those two numbers, a couple grand, goes in your pocket. So that's an incentive, if you will. You've shifted the risk to the provider. There's lots of examples of this in oncology. This is from the NCCN guidelines. This is an interesting one. Asymptomatic patients, uh, hormone refractory prostate cancer. Here's what the NCCN says you can do. Uh, CIPT or Provenge, which was mentioned several times yesterday, as well as I think this morning. Secondary hormone therapy docetaxel, or clinical trial. Clinical trial is hard to price, but we price the other ones. And this is what it looks like. Now, the monthly, the all-in cost of Provenge, last I checked, the ASP was about 93000 This is a monthly cost, if you will, compared to monthly costs of these other regimens. Here's uh, abiraterone, which doesn't, uh, I don't think it was on the prior slide, but anyway, it's, it's now recommended. Uh, so, if you will, this is an opportunity for episode-based payment. If the NCCN and other organizations, by the way, AUA as well, say that these are all appropriate therapies, why not give a bundled payment to a urologist or a medical oncologist taking care of metastatic prostate cancer and say, you pick. Here's your amount. And who knows how much that dollar amount would be. Probably wouldn't be 37000 It probably wouldn't be $43,000. it would be somewhere in the middle. In fact, this is how this works. This is how it worked in inpatient prospective payment system in hospitals. And this is why bundling or episode payments where you shift risk work. What happens is you start with a starter number. It could be the average of all spending. It could be the average of all spending plus 5%. It doesn't really matter. And then once oncologists face these different incentives, they will behave in certain ways. Okay, they'll be somewhat shyer about doing, let's say, Pam Carbo, because it costs them $3,500 out of their own pocket to treat their patient with that. They might steer a little bit more towards tax all carbo, where they'll make more than $2,000 every time they do it. And what happens over time is that incentive changes the market basket of drugs that are used, changes the average, and actually lowers the average cost of care over time. This is how we save money in hospitals, and this is how it would work. Oops, I'm sorry. So you start on fee for service, you start with an initial episode based payment, which is just the average of those things. Or, like I said, you can go up, you can go down. And as oncologist practices change, you'll get recalibration. And this is where 
whoever the payer is, Medicare in my example, saves money. Now, you can put bells and whistles on this. You can put lipstick on it. It doesn't matter. This is the basic structure of the incentive. What are the challenges? The first one actually isn't that big a challenge. It's just accounting, right? How big should this payment be? What should go into it? How do you add it up? What costs go in? It's actually an appealing thing. When we wrestle with paying doctors, you know, for an evaluation and management service or something like that, you know, we have to kind of guess how much these things cost. But this, if you will, moves the, the costs and the allocation of services down the chain to the people who are facing the risk and making the allocation decisions. It's easier to figure out how much a payment should be if you're being super narrow. Drugs and admin. You know, don't even do, as, as Lee mentioned, does, I, I, I don't want to get this wrong, but doesn't include certain E&M services in, in the payment because let's make sure that those aren't hindered. But you know, you can, if you start with drugs, it's about 73, 74 cents on the dollar of, rev of revenue for an oncology practice. And you could just do that, and the accounting is easy, and actually the capture and the billing is easy as well. Staying narrow leaves behind opportunities in areas that we think there's a lot of promise. John Sprandia, who is here, I saw him at the coffee break, has talked about how his practice, by shifting the way it provides services to patients, is actually meaningfully, measurably, and in an audited way, reduce the frequency of hospitalization. If we could give his practice, at appropriate scale, a payment that included the hospitalization costs, his practice would actually make money by avoiding those services because they wouldn't have to spend to pay the hospital or the ER or something like that. That gets way harder from scale and other sorts of rare event problems from in this sort of a math problem, but still, it, if you will, it's a place to go. This is a harder one. When are the treatments really substitutes? Now, I put up that slide from the NCCN, and like I said, there's six other organizations recommending these different regimens, and say, look, they're all substitutes. I'm just a dumb pulmonologist. I'm not the only one who thinks that, by the way. And, you know, I don't know. I just am believing the guidelines. But the truth is that there are important differences, perhaps, between these regimens. And if the guidelines say they're all OK, then we should be able to do this. But then if you sort of have a beef with it, you have a beef with the guidelines. The lung cancer regimens have either directly or indirectly sort of through the transitive property largely been compared. That's not true in some of these other areas. Right? The prostate example I gave is, an, is sort of a place where there's a little bit of guesswork. If you go to early stage prostate cancer, we don't have adequate comparison between radical prostatectomy and XRT, let alone watchful waiting. Right? So to say they're all the same is, is basically mistaking the absence of information about differences with proof that there are no differences. And that's a common conceptual flaw that you see sort of cropping up. And this has been a big problem, keeping people from thinking this is least costly alternative payment. Right? Not, no one is saying, just give everyone the price for tax all carbo. Everyone's saying, let them, if you will, the market decide. I don't mean to sound like one of the presidential candidates, but the, let the market decide sort of what the right mix is. What percentage of patients will benefit from PEM carbo over taxol carbo or something or anything else in between and sort of let the mixture go the same way we do in the hospitals, right? We don't say everyone with pneumonia has to go up, be out the door in 46 hours. That's just sort of the average, right? But you have some patients who are gone in 25. You have some patients who are there a week. And that all goes into the bucket. Now, there are other ideas in uh, patient-centered medical home, which is essentially, and I'm, I'm thinking of this purely from a financing standpoint, not a conceptual one. But the idea is add on payments for coordination. There's sort of eventually a gain share back to the primary doctor, this home, home body or whatever. And John has talked about doing this in oncology as well. But eventually there's a gain share for coordinating care, providing higher quality care, and avoiding some complications like ER visits. There's quality and other measures. Uh, measures and modifiers to the payment system that essentially try and get away from this more equals more approach to payment, which is what the fee-for-service backbone always does. COPE, we have the first draft out now for the PPS exempt hospitals. Hospital Compare has some measures that are leading to different payments for hospitals. That's a general trend. And then there's disintermediation. I want to talk about this. Now, Lee already went, so I have the advantage of now talking about his program without him being able to contradict me. But uh, I'm going to talk about the United Healthcare demo, brown bagging, and CAP, which are related ideas. So, United Healthcare, what, what Lee is doing at UHC is also bundling. But there is a difference between what I've just presented and what he presented. In the UHC context, the drugs, the major driver of costs, are managed through pathways and agreement about common protocols. There's no risk shifted to the doctor and then sort of selection of therapies based on their risk. And the way they approach this is to simply pay, not simply, but to pay basically invoice prices. 
for cancer drugs. They make them pass through. Another way of saying this is you've disintermediated the doctor from the profit or loss incentive inherent in the buying and reselling of cancer drugs, which is the old model for how cancer doctors made their money. That is, if you will, the antithesis of the episode-based payment model that I just presented, where it's all about the doctor making or losing money buying cancer drugs. It just shifts. But the UHC model is doctor gets management fees and essentially no profits or losses from drugs. Ground bagging is a different version of this, sort of the shipping, essentially the drop shipping of cancer drugs to the cancer patients completely from the insurer and an intermediary completely leaving the doctor out of it. And then there's cap. And so I'm old enough to remember this. I was actually at Medicare when we were trying to institute this. In 03, the Medicare Modernization Act, there was this idea to institute a new entity who would drop ship drugs to the oncologist and deal with the beneficiary directly. So the oncologist wouldn't have to buy and resell cancer drugs. They would just kind of arrive. And this intermediary, this third poor party, a for-profit entity, would buy the drugs from the manufacturers, ship them to the practice, collect the copayment from the insurer, build the Medicare program. That was the idea. It failed for a number of reasons. Oncologists didn't sign up for it. It was an opt-in program. Uh, it had a lot of drugs that sort of didn't make any sense because they were too cheap to sort of go through the administrative hassle. But it has seen a resurgence of interest in a pared-down form. This is the legislation that's relevant from the MMA in 2003. You don't have to read it all, but the basic idea is that this competitively biddable entity would buy and resell the drugs. This is the potential for it. This is a 2010 chart, some of the drugs I've just shown you from other slides that weren't on here yet. And this represents 47% of all Medicare Part B spending, these 10 drugs in 2010. Now, Lucentis here is not a cancer drug, neither is infliximab, and neither is tacrolimus. I don't know why I did this kind of accidentally and I couldn't get rid of it. Um, but anyway, the, if you just focus on cancer drugs, and by the way, there's no reason you should. We, why, why leave rheumatologists out of this and ophthalmologists? But if you just look at these things, this is a meaningful slice of all spending on cancer drugs, just these high-priced drugs that sell, sell reasonable volumes. A modified cap program, which the legislation allows, could focus on just these drugs. In fact, in my sort of uh, enthusiastic way, I'd like to think, uh, I think it would be an interesting idea if you put drugs that has a certain sticker price and above into such a program, because the administration and financing costs would make sense in that context. But this would, you could just disintermediate docs from these high-priced drugs, take some of the economics out of the practice, get a third party in there which has more, uh, if you will, flexibility. And this has become something that a lot of people in Washington are talking about, that general idea. So then there's this idea of sort of eliminating harmful services or services that have zero benefit. And I list, listened yesterday, a number of people referred to this as zero benefit services, potentially harmful. I don't know much about these things, so I did actually go about the business of trying to figure out if this claim was right. And what motivated me was what I consider a, a difficult elision between the notion I brought up earlier, that services that have not been well studied or well understood are confused with services that are equivalent. And also what I think is a moving target, but a sort of shared, silent agreement on what it means to be zero benefit. So anyway, this is the prostate, if you will, the second one. Don't perform PET CT and radionuclide bone scans in staging early prostate cancer. That's an NQF measure. It's in the Choosing Wisely campaign. We pulled the references just because I was looking to say, well, okay, that means I shouldn't do this test because I never find metastatic disease. So it's a pure waste. Now, in the staging of early stage prostate cancer, finding metastatic disease before initiating treatment matters a lot because it affects the primary course of therapy. Surgery, for example, wouldn't be performed. The only trials referenced in the background, and then we did a forward search on it, said that don't actually look at the subgroup that's defined by the choosing wisely, and this is the false negative rate. 5% of men who fit these low risk criteria will have a positive scan for metastatic disease. Now, this doesn't include all the low risk criteria that the Choosing Wisely campaign does, so the number is probably lower than that. But if the error rate is, let's say, 1 in 20 or 1 in 50, I'm not the one to judge whether or not that's zero, but I kind of think it's not zero. This is what it is for breast. And again, these are low numbers if you look at the Choosing Wisely campaign, but they're not zero. 
And I'm not saying we should be doing all these scans. I don't have any interest in this. I'm a salaried physician. I have no idea how much revenue we generate from any of this stuff. But I'm cautious that we will comfortably mistake 2% or 3% with 0% or, or comment about other things as being sort of not important without going through some sort of formal analysis. In other words, these are not services that provide zero benefit. Now we'll get to the hormones. Why can't we all get along? All payment modifications, episode-based payment, the UHC demo, disintermediation, all of these things, choosing wisely, they depend on a sort of shared understanding of what constitutes high quality care. And then the next question, which is, makes me worry, how large could shifts be from payment changes should we worry? And can we go from eliminating waste to reducing marginally beneficial? Here's the FDA news release, November 18, 2011. The FDA saying Avastin is not safe and effective for women with metastatic breast cancer. Here's the NCICN guidelines coming out four months later, listing the drug as approved or as recommended. CMS has no idea what to do. Here it says they have to cover if the FDA approves it, but they don't otherwise. And here, and, and Amy talked about this yesterday, they have to cover it if it's in the compendium. It's still covered by CMS. It's not just Avastin. These are the different guidelines for the management or screening for breast cancer, different respected organizations, different tests. There is not a single source of agreement on this entire slide. And when we think about changing payment, a radical idea like episode-based payment, it's more modest ideas like CAP, the one thing you have to remember is it will affect treatment patterns. This is what happened with the MMA. This is day zero, changing from AWP to ASP. These are three different drugs used to treat lung cancer and the frequency with which they were used in patients with lung cancer and Medicare. It doesn't even matter what these three drugs are. It doesn't matter. All I can tell you is that nothing else happened this day. There was no black box indication let or label report, no early release in the New England Journal, no late breaking ASCO news. Payment changed, treatment changed. Here's an article from the Atlas, uh, Dartmouth Atlas Group. This was the ASP, AWP to ASP change in the physician office. This was the same change in the outpatient department. This is the utilization of certain chemotherapies prior to death. The important implication of this is that if we change things, treatment patterns will change. So we have to be quite sure. For sure, the current system is bad, problematic. But that doesn't mean that if we fix everything, we'll necessarily get a better health outcome result. And then this is the last slide. We can talk about zero benefit services, but it gets much harder, and Deb alluded actually to this drug yesterday as well as some other ones. Um, it gets much harder when we're talking about something that's minimally beneficial. This is the FDA uh, registration trial for Zaltrap, led to approval. The difference here is the median, and you can see, by the way, this passes the ASCO test. I can get the pointer between the Kaplan-Meier curves. Oh, you guys don't know that one? <laughs> the, the corollaries, if you can do it after a cup of coffee, it gets the plenary, and uh, Times Reporter will call it electrifying. Uh, so the, anyway, the difference in medians over 1.44 months, with, we use the standard number of, the mean number of, reg, of uh, treatment cycles delivered in the trial. This is the cost from a Medicare perspective for a life year gained, not quality adjusted. Assuming quality of metastatic patient, patients with second line, getting second line therapy for metastatic colon cancer is not perfection, that number would go up. What are we going to do about stuff like this? How are we going to handle that? Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Almost see him lining up now, Peter. <laughs> um, let's see. I think we're going to have uh, Joanne Schottinger go up next, please. She's with uh, Kaiser Permanente, and she's going to talk from the integrated system perspective. Thank you, Dr. Gans and Dr. Shi. Thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm delighted to be able to speak to you and to have thoroughly enjoyed this conference for the past day. Um, I'm from Kaiser Permanente. Uh, we represent the nation's largest nonprofit health plan, and Kaiser consists of the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan, Kaiser Foundation Hospitals, and I work for one of the Permanente Medical Groups. 
We take care of 9 million members, so about 3% of the United States population. We have 16, 000, over 16,000 physicians, 172,000 employees, and we're located in these regions throughout the country. We diagnose nationally about 45,000 cases of cancer each year and take care of about 350,000 survivors. Um, we are linked by an electronic medical record, which shall remain nameless, but we love our electronic record. And one of my goals, by the time I'm done, I hope you'll uh, understand why. Um, our members are with us on average for about 20 years. So with our National Care Management Institute, when we started to look at the Cancer Care Initiative, we're really looking at the entire journey of the of the patient again because they're with us for decades so what I want to focus on today is going through some of these buckets a lot of our emphasis kind of our DNA is in prevention um, but I want to go through screening diagnosis treatment and of course survivorship what we call complete care is what we hope to deliver again um, ably assisted with our electronic record to every patient every time and every encounter so our practice guidelines which usually mirror USPSTF and our and our evidence base are built in with the electronic record at the point of care um, I will confess we have about a building full of IT people um, so we this is not the way this this system came out of the box a lot of this is what we've built built and continue to build. Um, so we have very robust decision support at the point of care. So what that means, um, if you are a member who's 55 years old and you tweaked your knee and you go in to see your orthopedist, if you have not been screened for colon cancer, if you have a gap in your care, the nurse in that office will give you a fit kit, a, a stool test that your primary care physician has already ordered in the record and says make sure you go down to the lab and get this done. If you don't go down to the lab within 30 days and return that kit to us, the regional outreach program is going to call you and say please come in, make sure you get that stool test back to us. If there was a Guinness Book of World Records for stool in the mail, we'd probably win it. We get in Southern California alone about 500,000 kits back every year. Um, we do have a regional safety net. Someone mentioned yesterday that it's important not to just screen people but to follow up on the positives. When you're getting back half a million stool tests and 5% of them are positive, you need to make sure that that person gets in promptly for the colonoscopy and for the evaluation. So any, and we also don't really want our orthopedists dealing with stool tests. We don't ask them to do that. Um, a positive test is copied back to the primary care physician who ordered it as well as to a care manager in the GI department to make sure that that person is very promptly brought in for colonoscopy and gets into their diagnosis and treatment phase as quickly as possible. In oncology, we're also expected to do proactive care for members that come in for us, for example, with diabetes. If someone comes into my clinic and needs an eye exam or hasn't had their A1C checked recently, my nurse is going to deal with that also to save the patient having to come back in for another visit. It's wasteful to say, oh, go see your primary care doctor and deal with that. When they're coming into our system, we want to address every gap they have at every visit. We also look at medication adherence. This, again, is something we built into the record. When I see a patient, I know if they're taking their tamoxifen, if they've refilled it. Sometimes patients aren't always, you know, we have real tight relationships. They may not want to fess up that they're not taking their medications. But the record tells us, you know, when did you last refill it and how much do you have left? If you haven't refilled it and, you, and you're beyond seven days needing your prescription, again, we will call you and we will make sure that you get your prescription filled. And those calls do work. Our own data has shown, we've done studies that have demonstrated for breast cancer and for CML, the medication adherence is critical and in our own population was very closely associated with improved survival rates. So in our efforts on smoking, one of the complete care that I um, wanted to mention was we have very robust health education and resources in all of our medical office buildings and medical centers. So our percentage of patients over 18 who are smoking has gone down significantly. We're down to about 9%. What we've seen with this is a fairly substantial decline in lung cancer incidence, and we are well below the SEER incidence. 
our breast and cervical cancer screening rates have consistently been above 90%. But for colorectal, a few years ago, we were, do we were down at around 50%. With those stools in the mail, with the proactive encounter at every office visit with the electronic record, we've really gotten our rates up now to over 80%. This is Southern California data. The, this is one of our favorite slides. Um, this is what we've achieved in the past four years. With a membership that's grown by several hundred thousand, we're seeing substantially fewer colon cancer cases. And most importantly, I'm sorry it's a little dark, we're seeing a stage shift with many more people coming in with zero and one, so that now about 40% of our patients come in with stage zero and one. Our hospitals are seeing fewer colectomies and hemicolectomies coming in. And the big difference on the top, if you see 50 fewer patients with stage four at presentation, it's not only 50 fewer people who have bad disease, they don't start that path of the, you know, as we heard yesterday, the $10,000 a month chemotherapy regimens. So we're very delighted to see this. And I know that in the first half of 2012, we're continuing to go down even further. So from, from our initiative at our national level, this is the program we're going to be spending our most focus on in the next couple of years, is trying to get the colon rates up over 90% as we've been able to achieve with breast and cervix. Yesterday, we talked a little bit about not over-screening people. We talk about the burden of overpopulation. When we deployed the HPV test about five years ago, we sort of looked carefully at our PAP screening rates. And our gynecologists were trained with you know, their gynecology buddies, and they were doing PAP smears every year. Our guidelines, USPSTF, everybody said the interval should be three years. With a lot of education, again, with um, reminders at the point of care and electronic record and with feedback to physicians, the OVERPAP rate declined from 42% in the first half of 2006. Now it's down to about 8%, including from our GYN colleagues. So that was a big move for them. What happened in the meantime, we didn't fire any gynecologists. They're all still working. But our cervical cancer screening rates went up at the same time. So they went from 79% when we started now up to about 90%. So really what we're doing is making access and getting more people in for preventive care that they really needed. OK, so I love my electronic record. We really do. We have the Beacon Oncology module. Um, we had had an electronic record first in uh, the general ambulatory setting and the inpatient setting before we started on the road to deploy Beacon. Um, this module addresses ordering, alerting, dispensing, um, bar we have barcoding deployed for safety. I, I will say again, this did not come out of the box this way. Um, we had a health plan president who said in his mind the first place he would put computerized physician order entering would be in oncology because he knew that the drugs we were delivering were, were basically affectionately called poisons and he was very concerned about safety. Um, we had a substantial investment not only from IT but a collaborative build team that consisted of dozens of doctors, nurses, and pharmacists from around the country and our charge was really just build it once. We don't want to have nine different you know, electronic records. We want to build it once. Um, at the time, we started collecting what was on paper, our protocols for doing chemo. Talk about variation. We thought we'd start with something straightforward like CHOP. We all, you know, CHOP, we all agree on CHOP. We had over 20 variations of CHOP. So we had to, we had to do some tough work to get people to agree. And again, fortunately, the health plan supported us with pharmacists who would do the evidence review for us. And now in our protocols, yes, we have reminders to do Hep B testing. And yes, we have GCSF built according to choosing wisely for the protocols where the literature suggests the risk of neutropenia was over 20%. Um, at the end of each protocol, you also get a link to the original article and the data that support if you want to just remember what the original literature said. We also link out to something we built called the Oncology Knowledge Database, which our pharmacists built for us. So if the creatinine bumps up a little or the liver function test or someone has um, toxicity, it's like how do you manage those and what are the best ways to adjust the drugs? So we think the advantage is obviously, and we would never go back, um, it's universally accessible and legible. Um, we found fewer safety events. Some of that was from the record, I think, but also from barcoding. 
Um, we integrate lab and pathology with this. Um, it has simplified our referrals to clinical trials and helped us incre increase enrollments to clinical trials. Um, we, we do assess practice patterns. Um, for example, we're looking down, drilled to the provider level. How much chemotherapy are you giving in the last 30 days in the end of life? Are you doing unwarranted care? Um, we, we have had to go back and rebuild some of our protocols. Um, we found particularly um, one recent example, TC, for adjuvant breast cancer. After we had had about 1,000 patients on that protocol, we looked at our own experience and found that in the community where patients are about 20 years older, much more diabetes, many more comorbid conditions, our febrile neutropenia rate with that regimen was around 28%. So we went back and built the GCSF into those protocols. And again, at the bottom, there's a link to our own data. We will have it published soon, but we've, we've, we had to you know, give our providers some information. So we'll link to our own data saying this is why we want to build it in there. And we think that ultimately looking at our regimens that way will really help us improve the safety of the care that we deliver. It has helped us also a lot in shortage situations. When the ARIS-C shortage was, was um, very critical, it really helped us to know immediately how much are we giving, who's getting it, for what regimens, how many pediatric patients did we have, because that was going to be our triage strategy. I'm delighted to say we have substantially reduced variation. Uh, we look at protocol adherence. That's one of our quality metrics. Ninety percent of our um, protocols are adhered to on the first round of therapy. Occasionally someone deletes an oncologic dr uh, chemo drug because of um, toxicity, but we have fairly good protocol adherence, and this is in all of the regions as it gets deployed. Again, decreased safety events. Um, we are probably going to have to build another wing on the research and evaluation departments in our, in our regions. Um, we have a comparative at a set Comparative Effectiveness and Safety Research Institute that uh, Beth McGlynn is heading up, and she's going to really help us evaluate, now that we have this rich database, some of the outcomes in community patients. So we've started first looking at um, things like febrile neutropenia, but I think I will go back to her with the gastric question, and I'm sure we have at this point a, a several thousand patients that have received those regimens, and really try to evaluate in our own hands what outcomes are we seeing and at what toxicities. As Dr. Smith mentioned yesterday, um, we have done several randomized controlled trials demonstrating the importance of integrating palliative care services. And in each of these trials in our own system, we demonstrated that there were substantial costs. What we're currently um, working on is trying to encourage um, more physicians to use shared decision-making tools with videos and links to, um, for example, some of the great MGH videos on what care in the ICU and what CPR really means to help our doctors start those, those difficult conversations. That's something that we will evaluate. We are, in, in many ways, a learning organization, and we will try to figure out the best place and the best way to integrate these videos. Um, what I wanted to close up with was survivorship. This is obviously where the bulk of our, our care is. Um, we do have care paths. Uh, we have those complete care functions for all of our survivors. We think our biggest opportunity and where a lot of our work will be in the next um, years uh, is really on lifestyle modifications. We've done a lot of work. We know how to drive tobacco cessation down. Um, but we, we have resources for healthy eating, healthy diets. Um, and one of the things that we've added, again, in our electronic record, we had to build this, was exercise as a vital sign. We ask every patient when they come in, on average, how many minutes are you getting a day and how many days a week? It is fairly stunning. Patients may fib a little bit about medication adherence, but they are brutally honest about exercise. And we found that our general population is very sluggish. We have only about 40% of our members getting the recommended 150 minutes a week. When we look at the subset of breast cancer survivors, they're very, very sluggish, years after treatment. So we think this is going to be a huge opportunity for us in terms of really emphasizing our lifestyle um, education and programs and getting our members more engaged with what we hope will be prevention for the next several decades of their life. So thank you very much, and I'm sure we'll be back for questions.
Thanks. That was great. So our final speaker is Craig Earle. He's going to give us a uh, Canadian perspective on how they manage costs uh, up north. Thank you. It's an uh, absolute pleasure to be here today. Sorry I couldn't have been here yesterday. It was Thanksgiving in Canada. Our, uh, our harvest is earlier, so uh, it's Thanksgiving Day. I've been asked to uh, speak from a view from two healthcare systems, and the reason for that is um, I trained in Ottawa, Canada, practiced there for a couple of years uh, while doing a master's in epidemiology, and then in 1998 went to Boston and between 1998 and 2008 practiced at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And then for the last four, uh, now starting into the fifth year, I guess, uh, have been back in Canada in Toronto. So, um, so I have uh, had a significant amount of experience, I think, in the two healthcare systems. So what I'm going to uh, talk about today is just my opinion on why cancer care is less expensive in Canada than in the U.S., but also why cancer care is more expensive in Canada than in much of the rest of the world, and talk a little bit about uh, some of the trade-offs there. So it's been said that Canada is all geography and no history. We have about 35 million people. We're one of the least densely populated countries in the world, uh, which means that we have issues, uh, geographic issues in healthcare delivery, although the reality is that three quarters of our population lives within 100 miles of the uh, US border. We're 73% white, 21% Asian. People of African and Hispanic uh, descent are each less than 1% uh, in Canada. And we have similar issues with an aging population. We have a similar east-west gradient. As you go from east to west, people get taller and healthier. My family's from the extreme east coast in Newfoundland. <laughs> And uh, the major religion in Canada is healthcare. Uh, if you want to get elected to public office in Canada, just suggest that your opponent is trying to, in some way, move us towards US style two tiered private healthcare, <laughs> and, uh, and you're, you're golden. Um, but people talk about the Canadian healthcare system, and there is no the Canadian healthcare system. There are actually 14 healthcare systems. So there are 10 provinces, three territories, and a federal uh, healthcare system that deals with refugees, Aboriginal, military, uh, etc. So Medicare in Canada started in 1962 in Saskatchewan and over the rest of the 60s spread to every province uh, in Canada. And initially it was more of an insurance uh, thing. I remember when I was younger having to pay premiums and uh, you could go to a doctor who was charging more than the provincial rates and had opted out so you'd pay cash and then get reimbursed by the, uh, the health insurance plan. But in 1984, the Canada Health Act was passed, which tried to rein in some of the, uh, the variation and, and free-for-all. And uh, it had several principles, one being publicly administered. The health care system comes from general tax revenues. It has to be free at the point of care. So now, and you know, I'd sort of forgotten about this until I moved back, but you never reach into your pocket for anything aside from your, your health card. No co-pays, no user fees, portable across the, the country. And this phrase that keeps lawyers in Canada uh, employed, uh, it said that there had to be reasonable access to necessary care. Try to define you know, any of the words in, in that sen sentence. Uh, there are other things that the federal government does, including uh, federal transfers. So when it all started, the federal government was paying about 50% of the cost in its transfers to the provinces. That's down now uh, to about 15%, despite every year they send about 6 or 7% more, but the costs are rising. So it's the provinces that deliver and pay for health care. And in most provinces, this is getting to be around 50% of the uh, provincial budget. Because it's uh, provincial insurance, it means that there are important differences in how healthcare is implemented. So in particular, some provinces are more centralized, others are more regionalized. Uh, oral drug coverage, pharmacare, varies widely from some provinces where everyone is covered for pharmacare, others where nobody is covered. And in my own province, Ontario, pharmacare starts at age 65. Before that, it's out-of-pocket or uh, private insurance. 
Uh, you can have different decisions on the funding of individual drugs. So, for example, Avastin, uh, you know, initially it, it was not being, uh, bef before the decision to fund it in Ontario was made, it was already funded in Manitoba and Quebec. And so you end up with these different sort of things until they all go through their process of deciding what's in and out. Home care, physician reimbursement, there's several differences that we could go on. Now, um, I don't know if people showed similar uh, graphs yesterday or charts yesterday. They all essentially show the same thing, even if the numbers are slightly different, which is that the per capita uh, payment in the US is twice what it is in Canada. And uh, although you can see that the other countries are much more similar, there's, you know, one of these things is not like the other. Uh, I guess if PBS gets its funding cut, I'm not sure if people won't get that reference. But um, so there's a, there's a definite outlier here, but that Canada still is the most expensive of all the others. Um, the next line is the general outcomes. And so we actually do do very well. Whenever this is uh, looked at, uh, Canadian outcomes are, are good and it's because everyone is covered uh, and, and there are very few barriers to accessing care. And it turns out that deciding not to cover Prevenge or Avastin in breast cancer doesn't really move your ranking on this, uh, this chart all that much. Um, and for cancer care, similar things have been shown. There was a study in The Lancet a couple of years ago that showed that cancer survival in Canada is better than in uh, several other of these Western countries that were, uh, were assessed. But where we have a lot of red is in all of these um, uh, other access type of uh, measures. And in particular there, this is where the wait times issue in Canada uh, comes up. So we spend uh, something like 10% of our GDP on health care in the United States. It's about 18%. So why are these costs uh, less in Canada? Well, uh, you know, there are several things, and uh, some of them are things that you could argue about, but I think one that's fairly uh, straightforward is the fact that we have a single-payer system does cut down on administrative uh, costs. So our administrative burden is about 3.5%, and depending on the number you look at in the U.S., I think it's whether they're including Medicare, which is lower, versus others. Uh, it's at least in the 15-plus percent range. Um, in the U.S. It's easy to bill in, in Canada. Uh, I pay someone about 2%. I actually have one of the more uh, complicated situations and money appears in my bank account every month. I even know a couple of my colleagues who are specialists, no less, who just do their own, uh, their own billing. Um, global funding of hospitals. Now this is one that I'm a bit ambivalent about because I think this is something that's responsible for a lot of our uh, access uh, and, and wait time issues, but I think it does lower the costs of care in Canada. And what we mean by this, global funding, block funding, universal funding, it's a historical thing where hospitals get a budget from the government. This many tens of millions of dollars for this year and you have to do everything with that. Whoever comes through the door, whatever, that's your budget, make it work. Um, there are moves to make it go more to what we call activity-based funding, something similar to prospective payment systems or, or uh, DRGs. Um, and I'm not sure how that's going to play out in Canada because the difference was in the U.S. you moved from essentially a fee-for-service system to prospective payment. We're moving from global uh, block funding to something that's more related to activity. So uh, it's unclear how that will play out. But uh, global funding of hospitals, there was, if any of you know the great British comedy Yes Minister uh, back in the 80s, there was an episode where uh, a new hospital won the award for being the most efficient hospital in Britain. It was a hospital that had been built, they had hired the administrators, but they had no doctors, nurses, or patients. And it was the most efficient hospital in, uh, in Britain. And that really does speak, though, to a lot of the issue around global uh, funding because it means that the incentives are to do less, to do it slowly. The more you do, the, the worse off it is for your, uh, your budget. Drug costs, incentives, and control. So all of these things are, um, have been discussed. The first drug costs, you always hear about people coming to Canada to get cheap drugs. Well, why is that? Well, it's for, um, it basically, it's because the provinces uh, negotiate with drug 
makers to get uh, a lower price. And in several provinces, I think it may actually be in, in legislation or at least regulations that they won't pay more than the median price in, in the OECD countries or something like this. There's some sort of an anchor above which uh, they won't go. And so our drug costs uh, are less, including for chemotherapy drugs. Incentives, when we talk about chemotherapy, we just don't have this issue of the provider uh, being the pharmacy. Uh, drugs that are publicly uh, paid for have to be given in public uh, institutions. No one uh, makes money or has an incentive to, uh, to give a more expensive drug. Um, uh, and control. So Lee was talking about some things like uh, making sure that HER2 was overexpressed uh, or that uh, KRAS was wild type before, the, uh, before uh, agreeing to fund uh, those particular drugs, Herceptin or Cetuximab. And that's the way it, it works in Canada for the expensive drugs. Basically, the uh, drugs of the last 20 years um, are reimbursed uh, separately in, in these sort of uh, controlled uh, types of way. And in general, um, the rules make a lot of sense. Uh, sometimes there can be a delay until they work out the rules, and that can be frustrating. Uh, similarly, tests. Um, you know, I understand that one of the fastest rising sectors uh, for cost are all of these um, uh, uh, molecular tests being done in, uh, in pathology. Um, so similar to drugs, specific tests, whether it's Oncotype DX, HER2, um, KRAS, et cetera, get uh, reimbursed separately by the provincial system. But others, uh, you know, an example would be MSI, which sometimes uh, I'm a GI oncologist, sometimes I am interested in. That comes out of the budget of the pathology department. And so they, you, you can't just willy-nilly do that. It's, it ends up being a, do you really need this? Will it really help uh, type of thing? Um, so it's not a situation where pathologists can just run up tests, send in a bill, and have someone pay for it. Uh, and then the last one I put here was malpractice insurance and everything that uh, flows from it in terms of defensive medicine. So all uh, physicians in Canada essentially belong to one uh, malpractice insurer, the Canadian Medical Protective Association. It's essentially a co-op. There's an interesting founding story that I won't go into, but uh, their, their uh, motto is by physicians for physicians. And so what that means is that if you bring a lawsuit against a physician in Canada that is without merit, you better be prepared to go all the way through the court system because we will never settle even if it's financially cheaper because of the precedent and everything that falls from it, follows from it. Now, if the doctor truly is in the wrong, they will settle, and, you know, but uh, it, it takes away frivolous lawsuits. The uh, second thing in Canada is that with the Supreme Court decision in 1978, pain and suffering was limited to $100,000 in 1978 dollars. That's now about $325,000, but it means you don't get these millions and millions of dollars um, uh, uh, decisions for that. Decisions can still be for millions of dollars if you're having to take care of a child that was injured in childbirth, but that pain and suffering part does not uh, come. And so I don't want to make too much of this because it had to do with rebates and surpluses and things, but actually last year my net malpractice premium was zero. Um, this year it'll be, you know, a few hundred dollars, several hundred dollars, but um, it's just, it's, it's a different system and I think has some merit. We do have some shared problems and um, I, I can go into more detail if people are interested. We have waste. We order too many scans and too many visits. We're probably in a similar situation with EMRs and it sounds like there's been a lot of discussion about that so I won't go into it. We could do more prevention um, and lack of incentive alignment is I think an issue for controlling costs in our system. And by that, what I mean is that it's actually most uh, physicians in Canada are fee-for-service, uh, or at least some sort of blended uh, reimbursement. Very uncommon, actually, to have salaried physicians. And so if your cancer center, for example, uh, it, it may be better in the interest of the cancer center not to have patients 10 years later after breast cancer treatment coming back for frequent visits and, and be trying to move away from that, for the physician, the financial incentive can be the complete opposite. 
And so we still struggle from this. We're not, we're not Kaiser. We're not completely aligned and integrated all the way through, and that's uh, a problem. Uh, present, but I think to a, a lesser extent, we do have self-referral issues among physicians, but it's on a different scale. It's more about uh, pulmonologists doing spirometry on everyone who comes in as opposed to referring to their own MRIs or proton beam therapy. Uh, and uh, we, get, we get your ads, so uh, consumer demand. <laughs> so why does Canada cost more than Europe? Uh, despite the fact that if you look at most of those European countries, they have more consistent drug coverage. And we also have uh, spottiness, I would say, in what we deliver in home services and home hospice, etc. Well, one is drug cost. We're uh, a small country, um, about half the size in population of Britain and, and France. And yet, uh, you know, where I said that they uh, negotiate to try to get volume discounts from, uh, from suppliers, only this past spring, for the first time, have the provincial premiers got together and said, we're going to try to find a way to do this together. It's every little province doing it. So we could have much more leverage than, than we actually have. Uh, physician reimbursement. Um, I, physician reimbursement is pretty comparable to the US. You know, we always have to worry about the issue of uh, brain drain uh, there. And so, for example, um, uh, it's, hard, it's a hard calculation to do, but my sense is that uh, medical oncologists probably have a pretty comparable salary to medical oncologists in the U.S. The difference is we don't have the spread. Uh, so there's much less of a difference in the uh, salary of an academic versus a private practice or community oncologist. Um, I would say that on average the academics do a bit better than the uh, academics in, uh, in the U.S., but we don't have people making uh, you know, well over half a million dollars in, uh, in the community. So uh, we have high physician reimbursement. This is a, a major cost in the healthcare system, and so while I hesitate to say it, uh, I think it is something that we need to think of. You know, whenever we read about these things, it's, it's uh, always, you know what, we need to pay primary care physicians more because there's such a difference between what they make and what specialists make. You know, we get paid pretty well, and um, anyway, it should be something that, uh, that is on the table. I should have a flak jacket on or something. <laughs> I'm worried about saying that. Um, why do we cost more? Well, most of the European systems have some sort of a blend with private insurance. They're, they're all quite different, but the fact that we have no premiums, copays, or deductibles, it's basic economics. Uh, you know, you don't feel the cost of your health care. That probably does contribute. Um, I'm not saying that I would advocate that, though, because uh, every study that looks at this shows that poor people don't get care as soon as you bring these sorts of things in. But it is something that makes that, that probably contributes to our care uh, costs. And then I've put a question mark with the lack of competition. I've already talked about this. Um, private care within a public system is something that's just started. The activity-based funding. These are things that in some jurisdictions, for example, when Australia brought in activity-based funding, they uh, decreased their uh, costs by 15% in, uh, in hospitals. In the UK, costs actually, if anything, probably went up a little bit. My suspicion is that in Canada, they would go up because there is uh, a pent-up demand that would then, there'd be an incentive uh, for it. Now, I should be ending pretty soon, right? And you guys probably don't care so much about what Canada could learn to improve its system. So maybe I'll uh, just kind of skip through some of these things and uh, go try to sum up a, a little bit with what the U.S. I think can learn from other, uh, other countries to reduce costs. I think a single payer um, uh, thing is, uh, makes sense. Uh, you know, Lee, I love you, but I'm just not always convinced on the value add of uh, private insurers to the healthcare system. Um, the market becomes uh, uh, health insurance instead of health or health care. Um, drug costs, negotiating the price, there's always this issue of, uh, well, you know, drug prices and reimbursement in the U.S. is how all innovation happens because that's how drug companies uh, make their money back. There are other ways to, uh, uh, to, to support research and innovation um, without bankrupting the healthcare system. Uh, chemotherapy at cost, this whole idea of, uh, of making half your practice uh, salary um, off of the markup, off of selling chemotherapy is, uh, is crazy. 
um, rational decisions, not rationing decisions, but rational decisions about expensive drugs with uh, oversight and control, medical liability uh, reform, and as I say, looking at issues around health professional payment and alignment of incentives. There are a couple of things that uh, I keep here, uh, hearing being floated that uh, I'm concerned may adversely affect quality in this country. And so one is this idea of the defined contribution Medicare. Um, as I say, the problem is that the market is for health insurance, not for health or health care. And you know, there's a middleman having to take money out of the system for that. Um, and uh, if it's to control costs, I completely uh, agree. It makes sense to try to incentivize patients to make market-based uh, decisions. There have been talks about limiting Medigap so that people feel the, uh, the effects more. But there are lots of studies that consistently show that the poor opt not to get care when that happens. Um, health savings accounts it makes sense for your yearly checkup and mammogram. But the problem is that health uh, care costs are skewed. 1% of people uh, account for a third of the costs. And there's no way that health savings accounts can really uh, make, uh, make a dent in, in those major costs. I do think there are some reasons for optimism. Uh, because I think we are all gradually starting to converge on a few things, uh, a few characteristics of high-performing healthcare systems. I think we are trying to all get universal uh, coverage, Obamacare, et cetera. Um, recognizing that there must be some mix of public and private. Here's where Canada is needing to move a, a little bit more. And in both countries, we are trying to get to this idea of integrated delivery, uh, accountable care organizations, aligned incentives as ways to control cost and uh, improved quality. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Yes, please. If the speakers could come up, we'll have some time for questions. Please. This is for Peter. I'm Lowell Schnipper from Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. You uh, made a comment about the top five and looked into the data. And I wanted to actually dig a little bit further with you, if I can. The um, Euro oncologists with whom we consulted and the literature we consulted specified a subgroup that was different to some extent than the one that you articulated because we specified low volume disease, PSA under 10, and a Gleason score of six or less. Um, and they reviewed for us three or four papers um, that accounted for thousands of patients who had a variety of scans, although I couldn't tell you what percentage had which type of scan. And there were virtually single digits of individuals with occult metastatic or macro metastatic disease identified at the time. To broaden the question, though, is um, what would you recommend as we go through a 6 through 10 list or how to modify our 1 through 5 list if, in fact, the bar is not one case do we miss of metastatic disease, which you and I both know when we miss it, it's a phenomenal disaster. And yet here we're talking about the best utilization of scarce resources. I, thanks for the question. And the one thing I'm sure of is I'm not the one who knows the answer to that, what the right cutoff is, what the appropriate trade-offs are. I think there are you know, formal decision analytic approaches that could start to address that question. And my criticism isn't of the direction of choosing wisely. It's actually around the language. And the, but you know, if you admittedly, the media filters things and reprocesses and restates things. But the language used, I was watching on the web yesterday. I mentioned this, and many times people referred to services as having zero benefit. And that's not the language you use during your rollout, and that's not the language actually in the publications. But the I think the distinction between zero and something is one we really do need to wrestle with in a in a proactive way. That and. That's, you know, that's why I pulled the literature. I was just curious what had led people to say zero. 
Yeah, I think that's probably a euphemism for what we really would hope for, but isn't necessarily the reality. I think in the JCO publication and in the Choosing Wisely initiative in general, I think the mantra is for the doc and the patient to sit down behind the closed door of the exam room, share the data, and basically then make a decision. So some patients may say, I don't care what you say, I want to have an X test. And there, you, you know, there the individual doc has to make a decision with that patient. But what we are trying to do is say, if we've got evidence that really suggests very, very minimal benefit, uh, we need to act on that. I, I, I understand that. And I, in no way, you know, in no way am I advocating for scanning all these patients, right? I'm not an oncologist. I don't stage patients. It's, but I was trying to highlight the challenge there. And if you will, it's a principal agent problem, right? The, the thrust of choosing wisely, bone scans don't harm people. At least I'm not aware of them harming people meaningfully. But so it is essentially, a, it is an effort that needs clearly defined parameters that we will stop doing these things collectively as a society. At least this is my view, because they're not beneficial enough to, to justify the costs. And put charging the doctor and the individual patient to make that societal decision, and as you point, will vary between patients, I think could lead to inequities and other sorts of problems. So I, I get the idea, obviously, but I just wanted to highlight that zero is not zero, and it's hard to round down to zero. Okay. Yes. Yes, Brenda Nevajan, Duke University School of Nursing, and um, I represent the Oncology Nursing Society on the National Cancer Policy Forum. Um, I want to bring in um, another um, um, area to, for consideration and, and comment, because we've really looked at a lot of the uh, affordability around treatment and diagnostics, but there's also the care delivery system, and that's the personnel and how the personnel um, work together or not. And we've, we've had a little bit of that from your, your Kaiser uh, presentation, thank you. Um, but I do remember, and I'm dating myself here, when physicians mixed and administered chemo themselves. And I remember that practice moving to nursing. Mm -hmm. And then I remember the mixing moving to pharmacy and that being supplied to nursing. So we've seen a lot, I've seen a lot of change in my oncology career, obviously. Um, and, and today we have a very um, in, in organizations, oftentimes very big personnel budgets. So when we look at affordability from the provider perspective, um, that is also an, an element um, in terms of cost and all. And I'm curious in terms of if there's been work done in any of your organizations and even the, the people who are on the first panel of looking at better ways of team practice of the, the best um, engagement of the various professionals. Um, I, I don't mean this to diminish at all the oncologist's relationship with the patient. That is key. But practice changes. It didn't make sense for, for physicians to keep mixing chemotherapy and administering it. And are we looking at other ways of the whole team engaging in this that improves access, improves quality, perhaps reduces cost? You know, this, uh, this is a very important issue that uh, I think highlights one of the problems of misaligned incentives within our payment system. So it's, it's this way in Canada. It was this way in uh, Dana-Farber uh, when I practiced there. It may not be this way in Kaiser, but the issue is that there are things where we should be working more with uh, nursing, with, with other types of providers, that it would probably be a less expensive way, at least until you get physician salaries down, to uh, deliver care. But the problem is that they come from different budgets, that the physician bills Medicare for his or her services, and even though for the system, for society, it might be better uh, for you to have a nurse, nurse practitioner, someone else doing uh, some of, of this work, you're sitting there in the cancer center and saying, well, the physician could do it. He bills fee-for-service. I don't have to hire a nurse. Everyone's happy. Everyone's happy except the taxpayer, the, you know, whoever else. So it's, it's a prime example of how we don't have the incentives aligned. And uh, you know, uh, similar to what Lee has been doing with episode-based uh, payment, we are also uh, trying to set up those sorts of systems within Ontario. But the problem is, similarly, 
the physicians are left out. And it's not the physician, that the physicians are left out. The physicians are strong lobbying uh, organizations that don't want to be in. Um, and so it's, uh, I, don't, I don't have a solution. I'm like Peter, but I think it's a, it's a huge issue. I think I didn't go over a lot on the palliative care slide because I was reaching my time limit, but we've clearly demonstrated that integrating our palliative care physicians into the oncology clinic is, is beneficial not only for our patients but for our, for our cost structure. And um, in addition to obviously having pharmacy and nursing with us, um, we expect to have social workers in all of the areas. I, I think they really they do have more time and, and, are, and are trained and do um, sometimes a much better job than the physicians in terms of addressing those, those difficult issues. I, I'm Joe Jacobson at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. I was struck that yesterday there was tremendous cynicism in the room and some said that in fact our whole economy has to crash perhaps before we recognize the seriousness of our current problem. And at the same time, uh, Joanne Schottinger, who I don't think I've seen since we graduated from medical school a long, long time ago, uh, <laughs> described uh, a very impressive system in Kaiser that seemed uh, to have a lot of solutions in hand. And what I'm going to say next, I say with real trepidation, because I'm not a health economist, uh, and because I don't agree with his politics or all of his solutions, but I want to talk about the work of Clay Christensen, who uh, very simply describes the solution to healthcare as a triangle. And in the top of the triangle, uh, he lists technological enablers or disruptors. And yesterday, we heard from a lot of people who would fall into that category of being disruptors who are trying but failing. The second part of that triangle uh, is uh, uh, innovative business solutions. And the third part of the triangle uh, has to do with facilitated networks, which depend on IT. And his argument is that unless all three come together independent of the industry, you, you fail. And as I thought back to why Joanne's may have uh, been successful, it's perhaps because all three parts of the triangle are being, uh, are, are, are being achieved. That is that I know innovation is going on because you're doing it. You have a business model. You're vertically integrated, I think, that most of us would love to have but don't have. And you do have a facilitated network, and you have an information system that works. So I guess I turn the question back to the group. You know, is, is the Christensen model the correct one? And what do we do for the rest of the country that uh, is, doesn't have the, you know, the perfect um, uh, agreement of these three corners of the triangle? So it's a great question. And I think the challenge, and Craig mentioned it, I think, a couple times in his talk, uh, we don't have a shared agreement on what we're buying. And so that makes it a challenge to innovate around it. Um, as Craig mentioned, that most of the what uh, individuals purchase is insurance. And then that's a crummy intermediary for improving health, population health. And so that, I think that it's one of the, one of the obstacles. OK. So Craig, my CEO, would be happy to be the single payer, and we can solve that problem. <laughs> Not an issue. <laughs> right. Um, Peter, to you and, and uh, for the rest of the audience, we prepped this in the back. But um, one of the reasons I, uh, the, the episode program we use does not address drug cost, and Peter's hits it head on. But we ran into this legal issue of uh, it would um, appear to the commissioner that uh, we would be specifically excluding coverage for one drug in the scenario you gave, the very high priced one. And so they were reticent to let us consider that. Um, would Medicare have those same kinds or would CMS have that same kind of uh, concern that you would be um, contrary to the compendium because one drug wouldn't be covered under that scenario if there was a high cost outlier in the group? And how would, how would you handle that and what, what workarounds would there be? So I, I, my, my first guess would be that through the CMMI enabling legislation, they would be able to do it. The, the critical feature is it doesn't disable the existing benefit structure. If you could probably, the manufacturers of that drug would probably advance the argument that this was so crippling to them that they're effectively become non-covered. Uh, but I'm not sure of that. Uh, the, 
in the paper, we describe actually a number of ways to, you know, reinsure around particular groups of patients, reinsure around outliers, uh, change risk corridor profiling, asymmetric incentives. There's a bunch of sort of actuarial approaches I think that could be taken so that that one drug could theoretically be used at some reasonable frequency without being uh, economically disastrous for the practice. The truth is those incentives are way too big, right? <laughs> Subtle changes cause huge practice shifts. But the important thing is the direction of the incentives. And could I just follow on this? Kaiser or Canada, are you able to exclude certain drugs from your formularies? No, that's illegal. No, not in California. <laughs> well, um, let me see. Exclude a drug. It, it may be in that situation, for example. So if you have a very high cost, uh, so you can take Prevenge or something like that. So it's not that the drug is not available. Um, it is available for pay out of pocket or through private insurance, but it's not part of the basket of goods covered by the uh, provincial uh, drug plan. Now, one of the things I think we don't do well enough is um, being very transparent with the population about this. And I think we should be much more transparent because it's not until you get metastatic prostate cancer and you start looking at this that you realize, hey, you know what? I've had conversations with people in my family. They, they don't realize that not everything is covered all the time. There's this uh, conception that it, it is, and maybe in the 70s it was, but, uh, but not anymore. I mean, in some ways, what you're talking about with your um, episode base payment and you know the thirty five hundred dollars or whatever it's it's kind of value based cost sharing you know you're not saying you can't have this you're contributing to it you're helping people get this incredibly expensive drug if that's what they and their doctor uh, choose to do and so you know I, I personally think we need to reframe more things like that um, certainly in Canada it's more of the sense like you've just been talking about of it's in or it's out. Um, but that's not really the reality, and, and if we think of it more as a cost-sharing, helping people get these things, if that's what they choose to do, that, that might become more palatable, uh, but still being realistic. I have a question for, for Peter and Craig. Uh, yesterday, Dr. Gans and Dr. Uh, Ramsey referenced uh, Don Berwick's uh, six wedges of, of waste. And the first three are really in the clinician's domain, failures of care, failures of coordination, and over treatment. Um, and the last three, administrative burden, uh, fraud, and pricing, uh, is really not in the clinician's domain. And pricing of pharmaceuticals uh, really is not in the clinician's domain. Um, about a year ago, after several glasses of wine, you, told, you explained to me, Peter, that the end game uh, of, of um, <laughs> your model was that less of the drug would be ordered so that, that the pharmaceutical company would be, would be forced to lower their price. Uh, a couple of days after after that, I was thinking more clearly, and I wanted to ask you, uh, the 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 uh, uh, whose domain is it uh, to address uh, pricing? And and Craig, uh, I look to your answer as well. I remember the liver rounds. I don't remember what I said. Uh, the um, right. So the end game is once you shift to a, if you will, a system that starts to look like a market, where doctors prefer drugs that are cheaper if they're equally effective as opposed to currently where they either are agnostic or in the old system and maybe even today's system prefer ones that are more expensive because the markup is larger in dollar amount that ultimately manufacturers will have to compete for the shelf space in a doctor's office the way you know Sony has to compete for LCD you know TVs by lowering their price and there are plenty of examples of manufacturers lowering prices to enter markets Right, I assume you mentioned some median price setting in Canada. I didn't totally understand the mechanism, but nevertheless, if it's set to the median of the OECD, if some manufacturer wants to sell into Canada, they're going to have to sell at that price. Right, the drug that's been mentioned a couple of times in the lung cancer example sells into the UK for half the price of what it sells in the Medicare program based on ASP. And the reason is because NICE set a cost effectiveness cutoff, and the manufacturer, Lilly, is able to meet that price. So. If we had a market system that worked, I think manufacturers would be able to do it. Right now, nobody sets prices. It's basically chutzpah. And then once drugs come on the market, they index. And the graph that I showed, the most compelling thing, and Deb Schrag, Schrag, Deb Schrag showed the same thing yesterday, is that the mo most powerful predictor of entry price is the entry price of the drug that came on before you. It has nothing to do with innovation, accelerated approval, number of patients served. 
it's like I said, it's it's just a game of chicken. Uh, and so maybe just to add to that, that maybe if we start thinking of the markets as being more global markets, which they are, um, as opposed to letting the, the free-for-all that, that you describe here, um, where we do look at other countries and say, what are other countries paying? Well, you know, we're not going to pay any more than that, or we're not going to pay more than 10% above, or we'll, you know, we don't want to be, it's just something that's anchored to the reality of what's happening on a, a global scale is one way of bringing every, it'll probably raise prices. So if you guys get into that game, it'll probably raise prices for everyone else. But it, uh, to, I, I think overall it would be, uh, uh, that, that's one way of looking at the market. Yes. I, so um, a question to uh, Dr. Bach. So I find the bundled payment idea very compelling and the examples you gave are great. And it, clearly we ought to be paid for providing appropriate care and not overutilization or underutilization. What I struggle with, and maybe it's a little bit of too black and white an example, but the lung cancer example you gave, looking at paclitaxel and platinum versus pemetrexid and platinum, um, good argument that they're clinically equivalent. Um, so you're in a scenario now where you lose money if you give one and you make a little money if you give the other. But how do you deal with the patient in that scenario where now I have a regimen that is cheap but always makes you lose your hair? And then I have another regimen which is more expensive but almost never makes you lose your hair. And I think you can argue is $6,000 a month worth it to prevent alopecia. But even if you assume that it's not, I think at some point you need to be in a situation where you're explaining to your patient what's motivating you in that circumstance. And it's the same thing with overutilization. But and I just, I'm not sure how you handle that because what would happen, you know, I give Pemetrexed and Platinum to most of my patients with advanced adenocarcinoma in the lung, primarily because of toxicity profile and because if you talk to people about it, no one wants to lose their hair if they don't have to, but no one would probably write a check for $6,000 a month, you know, to, to lose their hair, to not lose their hair. So. I think I might have, but that, so that, that Ditto. Right. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's an important example, right? And I like I wasn't I wasn't being facetious when I said I'm just some dumb pulmonologist. I don't know. I look in these guidelines. The guidelines tell me that they're all appropriate, right? If there's an important if alopecia is an important toxicity, then the ones that cause it shouldn't be in those guidelines, right? But so I'm just sort of saying, okay, look, there is a market, and if we believe these sorts of things, then we have to consider them interchangeable. I get these challenges and nuance, and the you know if taxocarbo is so toxic, it shouldn't it shouldn't be on there. And, and it, it's not, it's a kind of, you know, it's a simple thing, but I think right. the same issue came up with the gastric cancer example that's been a couple of times. Different regimens, clinically equivalent, different side effect profiles. One, you need a pump to get 5-FU. One is an oral, which is much more expensive. And so how do you trade off the costs and the values of that? And, and I, I did try and touch on that, right? This is way more complicated than, you know, copying a slide from the NCCN and putting it up here, right? That there are, this is a multidimensional issue about costs survival prolongation, quality of life, inconvenience, that stuff all needs to be in there before we say two things are the same or not. And it's why I pointed out that I think it's a little facile and potentially dangerous to say two things are the same that have never been compared along those dimensions. Thanks. Uh, Tom, Tom Smith from Johns Hopkins Sydney Camel Cancer Center. Um, besides Kaiser, there are some other really good models there that have substantially reduced cost and sustained quality uh, it's too bad that Russ Hoverman from U.S. Oncology couldn't be here because I think they're doing some really innovative work. And what they've shown is that with, um, well, they do a couple of things. For most diseases now, they have very well-organized pathways that actually limit the number of drugs that you can get. So for first-line therapy of lung cancer, it's carbotaxol plus or minus Bev, Avastin, if it's indicated. And that makes great sense given the randomized phase three control trial that was released two weeks ago showing that that's actually slightly better than carbolimta bevacizumib. Um, so strict pathways, first line ther therapy is covered, second line therapy is covered, third line therapy is covered, fourth and fifth line isn't covered because there's basically no evidence to, to support that. They also give the cost of the regimens or rather the price of the regimens to every patient up front. They just started this a few weeks ago. So every U.S. oncology practice, actually, you meet with the financial counselor and you get the cost, the total cost, and you get your responsibility cost. So to say that we can't give people costs is disingenuous. We can. We obviously send people bills so we know how much we're paying for them and how much we expect to get reimbursed for them. Um, they also put in, uh, besides the guidelines, earlier use of palliative care 
and you meet with somebody, usually a social worker or a psychologist or an advanced practice nurse to go over advanced medical directives, durable power of medical attorney, and how you want to spend the rest of your life. With, with this, they have maintained survival exactly. In fact, with colorectal cancer, people on pathway and live slightly longer than those off pathway, which is probably just a fluke, but it's not worse. In the, all the disease, diseases they've studied so far, people live at least as long, if not longer, but they've reduced the cost of care by 33%, one third less care. So we can do this. It's just going to have to mean that we say no to, to consumers, we say no to pharmaceutical companies, we say no to other people within the system. So we can do this. I'm fairly optimistic that we can do this. It's just going to require some tough decisions. And if I were U.S. Oncology, I would go back now having the randomized phase three controlled trial data showing that Pemetrexid costs $6,000 more, allows some people to maintain their hair, not everybody, Peter, um, <laughs> allows some people to retain their hair, but actually the number of people discontinuing treatment on the two trials because of toxicity was exactly the same. It was 3%. So you trade off toxicities. So I would go back to the manufacturers of Pemetrexid and say, this is how much we'll pay you for your drug. Hi, Larissa Nekhludoff, Harvard Medical School, Harvard Vanguard Medical Associates. So um, I've collaborated in research with Kaisers for many years and in, in, in survivorship, and data has consistently showed that there is underutilization and overutilization of a variety of different services. And so it looks like from your slide that there are definitely mechanisms in place um, to encourage um, to discourage underutilization, but I'm just wondering what disincentives there are for overutilization. Um, and on a related note is, um, you know, there's very little evidence for most of cancer survivorship care that we offer. And so I'm just wondering what Kaiser is doing and perhaps Canada to develop standards for survivorship care to really get at under and over. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, in terms of survivorship care, we, we are developing pathways, and you're right, there's um, little evidence. So in our system, we try to be a learning organization. We have different models that we're evaluating now, um, ranging from a, a, in Georgia, they're asking women, breast cancer survivors, where they, whether they want to be followed in a survivorship clinic or continue follow-up with their oncologist. Most of the women are opting for the survivorship clinic, and they seem to be actually happier not seeing their oncologist. Um, hard for us to believe. Um, it, to, to, different, uh, to different models um, in, uh, in Southern California, we're evaluating models with um, integrating some uh, primary care um, nurse practitioners into the oncology unit. I'm not exactly sure which model is best yet, but we are in the process of evaluating those. What we what we do look at, though, in the evidence is what what should the care be? You know, so are are we assessing you know the obvious lifestyle factors, smoking, weight, exercise? Um, are we are we getting the mammogram done every year? Um, did they did they um, get their their care gaps filled for things like colon cancer screening and, mm -hmm. and have their diabetes under control and get their lipids. Um, so, we, so we know that there are some evidence-based interventions and we want to make sure that they get those. But the exact model of who delivers the care yet, we'll, we're in the process of figuring that out. And disincentives for physicians for overutilization, so tumor markers, PET scans, et cetera. Um, there's not dis there's not disincentives the the incentives that the only incentives that we have in our salary are for basically more quality so it's for tobacco cessation cancer screenings diabetes and hypertension control and patient satisfaction we do though measure our physicians regularly so we so we do look um, how often are you seeing your breast cancer patient back are you seeing her back three or four times a year um, when, our, when our guidelines suggest that once or twice a year may be necessary. Um, are, are you doing those additional marker studies? Uh, you know, so we do measure, but there's no real incentive, just that we all want to look good. We all got A's in, in high school. We all want to look good. Um, and we're just starting to address this sort of thing. Um, and the way we've been doing it, you're right, there's not a lot of evidence in most situations. And so we've taken the approach of, uh, at Cancer Care Ontario of putting together 
uh, panels that will review the worldwide consensus guidelines about uh, you know what's reasonable and you know trying to keep it so that it's not uh, the maximum of everything uh, said and not necessarily the floor but just something that's reasonable with a view of uh, so at least if if people can buy into the process it may not be as evidence-based as some of our other guidelines but at least there's been a process we can make a chart that shows you know NCCN and Australia and everything else and say this is why we're picking this recipe and then the second part of that is models of care so also looking at the evidence evidence for different models of care, whether it's primary care follow-up, nurse-led uh, clinics, et cetera, and then using that um, consensus, those consensus guideline standards as a tool that can then facilitate uh, other models of care and supporting through different pilot studies, uh, pilot projects, trying to get, for example, a uh, cancer clinic to set up uh, a mechanism so that uh, um, breast cancer patients get repatriated to primary care or setting, I love that term, it can, it, 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 we don't push them off, it's repatriation, it's more, uh, uh, because often there is a pull, these, these physicians want to be involved. Um, so that's the, the way we're doing it, recognizing that there's not great evidence, but having a process around consensus to make reasonable standards um, that can then try to uh, drive exploration of new models of, of care. Okay, I think we have to uh, end this session. We're going to take a 10-minute break. But before we do, I, I want to uh, just personally, since I'm running this session, thank uh, the community oncologists and practitioners who came and presented uh, those of us who are so-called thought leaders, we get a little play in our schedules to do this, but you take real time out of real practices, and we're greatly appreciative of you coming and spending time with us. Uh, and um, so 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and have a wrap-up panel discussion. <laughs>